hello everybody. Welcome to the PRCA webinar on AI in PR, the legal landscape, IP challenges and future possibilities. I'm Claire Williamson. I'm the founder of Resonance, um, a B2B technology communications consultancy, and I'm really privileged to be the moderator today. Um, I'm joined by a fantastic panel of speakers. Um, first up, Kristen Philbin, who is trying to sort out some AI in the background. Um, she is the founder and managing director at Core Concept Strategy. We also have on this call uh, Oliver Fairhurst. He is a partner at law firm Lewis Silkin. And we've got uh, Frederick Renasto, who is the chief product manager at My News Desk. Um, before I hand across to the panel, um, I wanted to give a bit of a scene setter for today's discussion. What you're going to get out of, of joining today. So we've all heard about AI in the media. Um, it's been front page news for you know the last six months, and I'm guessing that almost everybody on this call has dabbled with ChatGPT. Where we are today is a culmination of years of research and development. Uh, as someone in B2B technology, I've been speaking about AI for as long as I can remember. But with generative AI, we've really witnessed an extraordinary rise in interest and progress in the last six months. The specific algorithm that evolved into ChatGPT was actually originally announced by Google in 2017. And Google understood, understood its potential, but they also wanted to understand its implications as they developed it. Now, there's a reason for that. A few of you might remember a chatbot called Tay, which was introduced by Microsoft. It was released onto Twitter in 2016. And Microsoft invited people to come in, try it out, and promised it would engage and entertain. But it turned out to be a public relations disaster for Microsoft. The chatbot was designed to learn from its inputs. And within hours, it had the, the worst of humanity had risen to the top and it turned into a hate speech spewing disaster. So it, it was taken down very, very quickly. So it comes as no surprise that Google didn't dive right in. However, it wasn't counting on a small company called OpenAI throwing caution to the wind and developing something called GPT-3 which then evolved into ChatGPT last November. Just like Tay, any one of us can speak to ChatGPT, but OpenAI managed to build a few more safeguards around it to stop it saying anything controversial. Most importantly, its ability to generate, te generate text was absolutely astonishing, and it's really captured the minds and you know, the imagination. If you want a letter written like a pirate, you can get it done. If you want to write instructions for removing a peanut butter sandwich from a VHS, you can get that done. If you want those instructions to be written in the voice of Logan from Succession, it, it can do it. Uh, but it's not just about content, and we're hopefully recording um, this via Otter AI for you know live transcription, so that you can click on a link. Is it working, Kristen? <laughs> okay, good stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, its success has skyrocketed beyond anyone's wildest dream. Within five days, it hit one million users. And by the end of the month, it had 100 million active users. Now, if you want to compare that to other disruptive technologies, it took the mobile phone to reach 100 million users 16 years. It took uh, the internet seven years to hit that sort of usage, and it took Facebook four and a half years. So the challenge we have today, particularly as an, an industry, is that this new highly and disruptive technology has come from nowhere, and nobody's really nailed down its implications and the evolved legal landscape of using it. As, a, as an industry, I think we've got to approach this with our eyes wide open, especially as the protectors of reputation. And this is exactly what this webinar is aimed to achieve. Um, so with anything new, you know, we've got to assess the legal consideration. So, for example, when you're creating a piece of content using AI, where does that IP st stand? Um, how do we protect our clients' data and privacy using AI tools? I think we've all seen the headlines of you know, code being leaked and sensitive information being leaked from big corporates. So we'll be discussing how it's already being used by our colleagues in the industry and then the legal considerations in more detail throughout the webinar. So I'm sure it's going to be a really exciting, lively, and informative discussion um, about the future of AI and public relations. And the final thing I do before I hand over to Frederick, who's going to discuss the implications uh, or, or how AI is already being used in PR, is if you have questions throughout this, please post them in the Q&A. Um, you'll find a little button at the bottom of the screen, um, and we'll do our very best to get to them. So Frederick, without further ado, I'm going to hand across to you. Okay, thank you. So. Uh... If you noticed, I'm from my news desk, uh, which is a platform provider of uh, PR tools. And we have been working with AI for a while. And I'm going to introduce a little bit the trends that we see 
within within the AI field and the generative part. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so I think this slide is something that we're working against and we've been noticing the trends and the winds blowing towards this area. Uh, so we have divided to make it really easy where you at and what the AI can help you with. So the strategy part is something that still is on you. You know the domain, you know your company. You can get help from AI, but uh, right now we see that you're in the strategy uh, area. But what the AI can do is come up with the ideation. And here it's the generative AI that we're gonna to discuss today. It can come up with ideas. It can tell you when the ideas is gonna be sent out, but it can also take an idea and write something for you. Usually it's just a draft. Uh, it can write a little bit better, but this is where your uniqueness comes in. And we're gonna discuss uh, this relationship today a little bit from a legal aspect. Uh, to continue, Finding your audience is not something you need to do. Google journalists and stuff. The AI could do that today, should do that today. So don't worry about that. Uh, having lunch with the journalist, on the other hand, is not the AI very good. So you take care of the relationship and the networking. Uh, the AI then knows exactly when is the best time to send something out. When are you going to send out your press release to a journalist? It depends depends on when have this journalist opened his email recently or when does people visit your newsroom and similar stuff like that. And the AI can also uh, take in all the analyze and, and make a real good insight report for you or analyze report for you and give it to you. And what it can't do, and I tried this uh, internally in the company, but uh, it's, it's not very, <laughs> it doesn't work very good, uh, is to present it to your managers, to your company, and here we where I noticed that the human touch is more important than basically on all the other ones to actually get the audience to listen. Uh, so that's how we see, and this is a little bit how, what we work at towards my news desk. We're looking at the bottom, what can we do to make the PR professionals uh, work day even easier? And we're seeing a trend, not only in the, news, uh, in the PR tools, but also outside the PR uh, area where that you see it kind of like an assistance. If you look at the bottom down, that's about the way you would use an assistant. And that's a little bit the trend we're seeing within PR, but also in other tools that the AI turns into an assistant for you. Uh, talking about these tools, we need to mention OpenAI and the chat GPT. So one trend we're seeing is of course, this prompt engineering. There's everywhere. People need to take courses, they need to be pros. And I always say to my customers that ask me, do I need to know ChatGPT? If you know it and become good at it, it's perfect. Use ChatGPT. You don't need to, then you don't, you, that's like the mother, uh, mothership of AI tools. Then you don't need any other uh, tool for text writing. Use ChatGPT, but if you find it hard to, to come up with the prompts and hard to follow along, relax and take it easy. Uh, the trend we see is that tools are integrating AI into, uh, into their features. So you don't have to know all the prompts. The, the companies will have uh, prompt engineers doing most of the work for you and you will write in small pieces of information and then the generative part uh, of that tool will create the rest for you. So you don't have to do all these advanced prompts. Talking about tools, and AI, there are super many tools coming out every day. So it is a jungle. There's actually a page where you can see all the tools coming out that's called there's an AI for that.com. Uh, it's fun to search around to. I don't recommend to just sign up for any tool that shows up here because some of them are just on a really basic stadium and you, you don't know the credibility of it. But, but it's interesting to see how many, for example, show, social media posting tools that's coming up. Uh, but to get more serious tools, uh, you have the, the PR tools that are out there today that are turning more and more into uh, the generative uh, text writers. So of course, my news desk, I wouldn't do a job failure if I didn't mention it, but write release is a new tool that just writes press releases and does nothing else with AI. You have agility PR that 
uh, also have this text generative uh, AI uh, for press releases. Uh, Profit and Propel, last time I looked, they did more against the pitching part of the AI. So they could actually customize uh, more for the pitching of certain journalists. Uh, and there's, of course, other tools out there as well, more and more. And I think all of the all of the PR tools that are out there, the big one session, will have some generative AI going forward. Tools for writing uh, is if you just need to write different stuff, uh, I really recommend Jasper and copy.ai. These are really good tools for writing. The, Jasper, and it sounds a bit weird, but that's one of the oldest one. It's from 2021, but they're actually got a really good tech stack and doing good stuff when it comes to writing. Uh, I put in tiny wow here, and if you see there's a star, uh, I know one thing I hate when I'm trying all of these tools is to sign up with my email and I get spammed and stuff like this. So I put a star on the tools that you can actually try out AI. If you never tried AI, you can you can try this out and you get sort of a feeling of how it is. Tiny wow is is uh, they're okay at it. Uh, I don't maybe recommend to use it going further. I'd rather use one of the uh, the ones I mentioned. But to use a tool uh, without sign up, you can do tiny wow. Uh, Grammarly is uh, it's not a generative AI in that sense. It actually can paraphrase text, but it uses AI in so many different uh, ways. I, it would be a, it would be really wrong for me to not mention it when we're talking about writing uh, in press releases. And then, of course, we already talked about ChatGPT, which is a really good writing tool. The tools for images that I recommend if you want to try generative AI within images, which I think if you never tried it, it's an, it's an awesome feeling. Uh, we have Adobe and their suite. Uh, they are coming with a new Firefly, which is in beta, but I don't think that's the real reason. I know a lot of people have been giving up on Adobe, but they're also putting like these small AI things into Lightroom and Photoshop and just change the lighting or, or mask something for you real quick. So it's actually make that work easier. It's not the ones with all the flares and stuff that they're promoting right now that's going to be the game changer. Uh, Mid Journey, I think that's the best tool when it comes to creating images. Uh, it's also, if, you, if you're not that tech savvy, it might be the hardest one to use because you need to go into Discord and use it. Uh, but it's, it's getting to, to use that. You need to learn how to write prompts, but the, the output is really great. Um, and if you want to continue using, it's quite cheap as well. I think it's five dollars a month to get access to a whole lot more uh, information from that. I put in Bria and Cleanup Pictures here because they are use uh, tools that you can use without signing up as well. Uh, Bria works like you just basically write what you want it to generate. It generates it, and then you can play around a little bit, removing the background uh, stuff like this. Cleanup Pictures is uh, this diffusion tool where you can put in an image or use one of the image they have, and you can just basically use the eraser they have here and mark a couple of things. And if you mark a pencil, for example, and then you just uh, click on the button, it will become a sister or something. And it looks really realistic. So just to try out that feature uh, that's in there. But if you want to go further and actually buy these features, I have, or especially the PR tools, which is where I work, we get a lot of questions and I think it's good to take these with you because everybody's going to scream for AI now. And that's not only on your level, but on a management level, uh, your managers are going to say, or if you're a manager, you are going to tell your employees, you need to work with AI. And the reason it's not, it's not the fact to only work with AI. It's the effect of working with AI that you want. You want to have the latest tech within AI. So you get the most effect of it. So therefore, I put these questions together. How long have you worked with AI? To ask a company this is part the legal system. If you work three to five years with AI as a company, you have ran into a couple of different legal issues and you have pretty good, uh, you know pretty well how that landscape look. Um, do you train your models on my data? And this is somewhere where ChatGPT, the free version, 
uh, they actually train your model and you can't uh, or train train their model on your data and you can't change from that you have to go to the paid version and then go into settings and turn that off uh, something you can ask the providers of PR tools is if they have assigned DPA with uh, with the, the ones that deliver in data so data processing agreement to see what actually happens with your data uh, the last question I think is super important if you want to keep up with the AI and what's happening so how does your roadmap within AI look and it can sound like a strange question but a lot of these PR tools are just doing it for the marketing benefits they're just putting marketing benefits they put the tool in there and then they can go really hard on the marketing that we have the best AI but what else what is happening next are they developing their AI data so you don't get left behind when the AI develops uh, there's probably a million other questions, but during my years, I think these are the best questions that I have seen. Uh, on my newsletter, we started with AI 2017. We started in 2003, so it took us a while. Uh, but here I just want to show uh, the DPA that we have with OpenAI with our generative. Uh, so look, look for these things in the terms and condition in terms and the terms of use when you look at new PR tools. Uh, we also, uh, this is, we, we probably will discuss this later, how to attribute uh, a press release. This is uh, one of our templates, AI templates that we have in our tool. I just put in some small things and it wrote this first text. Uh, and then it's actually asking questions as a journalist back to the text so you can make it a bit thicker. But the important here during this uh, session is uh, what actually says here that it's AI, it, it's suggested by AI, but it's revised and edited by the author. And I think this is a little bit where the discussion will lead later today. And if you want to try it for free, you can always go to my news desk and we will have this uh, on the first page without signing up. Uh, that was a quick on the landscape or the platform landscape. Uh, Claire, back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Frederick. Um, I think attribution, that's a really interesting point, which leads very nicely into uh, Oliver, who is going to share with us some insights into the legal kind of landscape and what we need to be thinking about when we're embracing these tools. There's a lot out there on the market. So what do we need to consider um, from a legal perspective? Over to you, Oliver. Thanks very much, Claire. And thanks, Frederick. It was, it was really interesting. Um, I'll just share uh, these slides. Um, just hopefully that's all coming up reasonably clearly. <laughs> um, so, uh, so my name is Oliver Fairhurst. I'm a partner at Lewis Silkin. Um, I am a, an IP lawyer, so an intellectual property lawyer uh, by trade. Um, uh, I and I think it's quite important to say I'm not covering the data protection angle on this, partly because we'd need about three hours to to sort of add it all in. Um, but hopefully, uh, hopefully we can still get get sort of all, all the all the key points. Um, now, uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is a very broad field. Uh, it, it's it's not really what we're talking about when we're talking about ChatGPT. Uh, that is a sort of subset of AI. So it is so. ChatGPT is a form of AI, but it's a specific subset, which is the deep, which is deep learning, is 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 what it's what it's known as. Um, and I won't get into the the sort of weeds of this, partly because I'm not a computer scientist, um, but also because it's it's sort of unnecessary for for present purposes. What we're talking about with ChatGPT is large language model modules. So, so sorry, that should say models, um, uh, and they are the, the sort of technology that really underpins uh, the generative AI and particularly the text-based uh, ones. Um, and it, it works by looking at huge amounts. And, and to say, when I say huge amounts, I mean absolutely inconceivably huge amounts of data. Um, and then looking at, uh, and then it works by probabilities to work out what is the next word that I should say in this sentence. Uh, and it can generate sentences and in, it can end up generating entire novels um, uh, just by using probability for the next word based on, on prompts and then those prompts can amend it and it can work on them. Um, 
And it, the, the key to understand there, and, and which I'll come on to, is the sort of the data sets on which they, they are trained really are huge, sort of essentially scrapes of the internet. Um, now, in terms of when we talk about scrapes of the internet, that is, is an important element to that, which is a scrape of the internet, it, well, for GPT-4, which is the current model of um, ChatGPT, it is a scrape of the internet in 2021. Um, so it's slowly being updated, but the, um, the and there are sort of iterations, as I understand it. But and one of the one of the points that GPT or ChatGPT will tell you is that the it, it factual elements can be wrong, partly because so partly because of hallucinations and that they, they can make things up, but partly because of um, uh, the time that it's from. It's also almost entirely English language based. Um, scrapes or largely in English language based scrapes. So it's not the most diverse data set. Um, and there's a lot of rubbish on the internet. So Oliver, not been sort of up. Yeah? I'm so sorry to interrupt. We're, you're not in full presentation mode. So people are struggling to see the, the slides. I don't know if you can. Oh, are you? Sorry, I'm not sure. So what can you see? Um, well, your both slides, the next slide and notes down the side. Oh, so right. Sorry. So I'm, <laughs> I'm on the wrong side. That's better. Right. Thank okay. you. So, um, so what do we mean by generative AI? I think we're focusing here, you know, uh, the same as Frederick was saying with his text generators, the text generators, chatbots, that's the sort of um, the chat GPT side. And then there's the audiovisual content generators. So that's the uh, images and now videos and uh, deep fakes as well, uh, sort of a big, big part of that, which is another area which we can't particularly cover today. Um, now, ChatGPT is the one you know, made by OpenAI, um, which is the one that everyone's talking about. Now, the underlying technology is what drives a lot of the things that you're seeing that have AI in them. So when people are saying, you know, look at our new AI product, quite often they, it's not their AI product. They have um, fine tuned or uh, added uh, sort of added layers onto what is essentially GPT-4. So, so there is a, there is a sort of lot of marketing sort of marketing of AI is a bit tricky at the moment because some of it they sort of suggest that it's that it's entirely uh, own AI. Others will make it clear, as Frederick just did, that that the that the underlying technology is GPT-4. Now, most people are quite happy to say that, but that, uh, because it, it you know it's it's the gold standard really at the moment. Um, but that is just important to know that not not everyone who is um, sort of advertising or, or sort of is, is marketing a, a, an AI product has developed that start to finish on their own. Now that's a good thing because it means that they're using sort of high quality things. Whereas if you had individual businesses with not much, not the sort of levels of capital that open AI do, it would be, there would just be sort of such varying levels. So actually we're getting really high quality AI as a result of the, the sort of plugins and APIs that are going into GPT-4. Now, chat GPT was something which no one would have even heard of um, a year ago. So just you know, to Claire's point, this has really come on massively in the last in the last year. And, and, and actually chat GPT was only launched in November publicly. Um, so and, and what we're seeing with um, what we're seeing with chat GPT is not uh, sort of the release of new AI. AI has been around for a very long time. What we've seen is the public availability of AI. So, so I um, advised a, a, a client, I think it was in 2014, on what was, we didn't call it that at the time, but it was generative AI, music generation. Um, you know, we were, we were, this stuff was around, but they, they had to develop it all by themselves. And now there are these large models which have been generated by huge, uh, been created by huge businesses who have, um, Sort of really kicked this on and made them available and i think that's what we're seeing now is a sort of an availability of of ai products that, that that really wasn't there before and the uh quality of it is something else that has, has sort of really blown up and um you know i just put in very quickly here just as a prompt you know give me a press release i think i might have added please because for some reason i keep doing that with uh <laughs> with chat gpt um, but it was, you know, sort of give me a press release. We've got a, 
business that's had a, a senior manager investigated for committing financial crime and it's come up with a you know really quite passable um uh press release so it even gets the sort of the format of them as well which i thought was was quite quite interesting um and then uh these are the image generation tools so uh you know it's, it's interesting actually so frederick suggested there were very there are a lot out there and Frederick quite rightly pointed to Mid Journey being a particularly good one. And I think all of the images on this slide were, were generated using Mid Journey and actually quite an old version of it. Um, it's moved on massively since then. Um, it couldn't do hands and fingers very well before and eyes quite often didn't quite look right. And there, there was sort of quite identifiable things that, that were obviously wrong with them. Um, but now they, they have sort of kicked on quite a bit. But Mid Journey is the, you know, is, is probably the, the best quality output that we can see out there. Um, uh, Stable Diffusion, which I'll come on to because they're being sued by Getty, um, uh, and DALI2, which is actually also by OpenAI, but I think it says quite a lot about their approach to the training of their model, which I think has been probably much more conservative than some of the others, that the quality of what comes out of it isn't as good. Um, it's not as artistic, it's not as creative, it's not as um, frankly impressive as you get on some of the other models. And I think that's probably because they're being a bit more cautious with, with what they're, um, they're using for the training. In terms of how image generative AI um, models are trained, uh, there is a, typically, the, typically works with a huge data set of images and associated metadata labels of some of some sort uh, that get fed in to the system and the system will train will train on them now the the classic example that's given and that's why we, you, i'm using this image here is the the is you say cats and dogs you feed in loads of pictures labeled cat loads of pictures labeled dog and you you sort of um and it, and it's, it eventually learns what a cat it looks like and what a dog looks like. And then you can take away that training set, the, the model's been trained, and then say, give me a picture of a dog, or well, the previous version would have been, is this a cat or a dog? Now it would be, because um, it's moved on from that, would be show me uh, a picture of a, of a cat and now show me a picture of a dog and you'll be able to tell. Now the, the way technically they, they work on this, or certainly with, um, uh, stable diffusion or stability AI is they take these images and then they apply noise to them until it's all noise and then they do the opposite and, and the, the model learns uh, what makes that image a cat um, and, and this I think shows shows it quite well and you can see how it's learned what a cat is through that process and outputted something that is not the same cat but it it sort of knows what a cat looks like and has come out with with that, which I just I just think it's uh, interesting. I mean, all this stuff I find very interesting, but um, it just ha how that sort of works. Now, um, this is a really good example, I think, and and sometimes examples are probably the best way of doing this, of of showing some of the difficulties with owning AI, uh, owning AI generated work. Now, this is a Philip Stark collaboration uh, and the idea was the uh, the model was asked to create a, a a chair with the minimum amount of material that could support a human um and and it the, the video comes from their website so i'm not sure exactly how how much we can rely on it um but this is this this is essentially what what it created which um is quite interesting it's very philip stark because it's sort of very minimal and you know sort of is what's it's it's form and function uh, combining it's got all of the um the the attributes that he'd be associated with but the interesting one of the interesting things is well who would own rights in these things because if you're using ai to create things and copyright in particular was 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 created as a right to protect human authorship so you know one of the I don't know if it's an apocryphal story, but the the the, the stories that certainly I've heard is that one of the issues with uh, uh, there was it, when when the US wasn't what it is now in in the early days of the United States, there was a lot of copying of English text texts, so whether it be novels or, or other things, and that wasn't protected. So copyright kind of arose as a need to protect authors to protect 
people who have created in the modern terms and certainly in Europe we call the author's own intellectual creation and that's what it's there well, that's what it's there to do and AI clashes a little bit with that because what is it trying to protect so the, in the UK and this is where we get into very very uh, territory specific issues now I'm an English lawyer so I spoke for, I'll speak from an English perspective but I do know um, other, uh, the, how the position is in, in, in various other jurisdictions now, in the UK, all of our copyright law comes from two sources. One is our own Copyright Designs and Patents Act. Um, and I'm not going to start trawling through that because you, you'll log off. Um, uh, and the other is from EU law. Uh, and EU law is, is sort of, again, it's, sort of, it's got its own, its own sort of harmonizing of, of European uh, copyright law. And that, to, to a large extent, still applies post-Brexit. So you might look at the UK Copyright Act and set, and you scroll down to, to section 93, if you want to know the exact reference, um, and you'll see that a computer generated work can be protected. Um, and the author of that computer generated work is the person by whom the arrangements necessary for the creation of the work are undertaken. Now that looks quite clear. Now that says, well, if a computer has generated an AI work, uh, 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 some kind of work, artistic, uh, whether it be a literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work, which is generally what generative AI um, uh, is creating, you'd say, well, that's been the someone has made some arrangements. And there's a question of who, but someone has made some arrangements with a computer, and the computer has kicked it out. So, UK copyright law does suggest that. Um, copyright can subsist in a computer generated work. The issue is with the interference of EU law, mainly with interference of EU law in um, uh, English copyright law, which requires that for a product, for something to be owned, uh, or for copyright to subsist, it has to be original. And for it to be original, it has to be the author's own intellectual creation. And that is quite hard to square with something where a human has inputted a prompt into a web browser and it's kicked out a novel or a you know an image or, or something like that or a video frankly so it, it that that is quite hard to square so whether or not copyright can even subsist uh, in in an ai generated work is not is not straightforward now some of the points that will be made eventually as this sort of works through is that if you're just putting a straightforward prompt in maybe that doesn't generate any copyright that you can own and we'll come on to the what that means um and the, the implications to that um so but it it, it it affects how you how you will deal with the work it affects whether it even whether it even has any protection and it's understandable why you, why it might not even be entitled to have any protection because it's all about protecting the, the right. Now, there's a distinction here between AI generated works and AI assisted works. So this is where the prompt has just said, you know, give me a picture of a tree and it gives you a really beautiful picture of a tree. Um, that is just purely AI generated, but where it's AI assisted. So where you make, a, you might use a prompt, show me a picture of a tree. Okay, now I want the tree to have um, a swing hanging from one of its branches. Well, now I want at the bottom of the tree for there to be children playing. And I want all of this and this and this and this and this to the point where you've kind of really, you really have worked together on this almost. And, uh, and then you, you, you're starting to get to the point where there is some intellectual creation that's gone into it. So the, there will be a sort of dividing line, I think, in English law at least, um, and probably in European law, where where copyright could subsist if it's been there's been more than just a simple prompt added. Now the the US copyright position, uh, which uh, we'll come on to now, has been much stricter. So this is a uh, a, a comic book that was um, created by uh, uh, Christina. Kashtanova, um, who and she 
apply to the US Copyright Office to register, which is something you can do in the US, register a copyright work. Uh, and it was registered. Uh, the, the Copyright Office just looked at it and said, yeah, sure, of course, why not? Um, she then mentioned it on social media and it, it drummed up a bit of a, a bit of a sort of interesting debate as social media often does. Um, and there was the Copyright Office then looked at it again and they retrospectively changed their decision. And they said, well, because this was created, use it as this one was with Mid Journey, uh, the, uh, the no copyright could subsist in it because it needs to have a human author and referred to various bits of US law, which uh, are outside my area. But the, the bottom line was uh, that because it was computer generated, it wasn't, and it wasn't human generated, uh, then, it, then that wasn't protected by copyright. And the US Copyright Office has then actually followed up with that, referring to it and sort of elaborating on it and making clear that the US Copyright Office's position, um, so I, I, as I understand it, and that's under Supreme Court law as well. So unless there were a new Supreme Court decision or new legislation, that wouldn't change. The, um, uh, the copyright wouldn't subsist in something that's been generated, at least using a prompt. So that's the point of whether copyright even exists uh, in relation to one of those, in, in, in relation to a work um, that's, that's been generated using generative AI. Then the question is, if if it does subsist, then who owns it? Now, this is the earlier version of Mid Journey, which is why the, the faces don't look, quite look right. And there's a little bit of a, a sort of, it doesn't quite look uh, natural. And I think there's sort of the whole thing just looks a, a bit odd. I think if, if we did this with Mid Journey, I actually also think this was with uh, Dali as well, which is what I was saying before. It just, just doesn't quite do what, you know, if, if we sort of go back to that, you know, you, you compare them, you can see the sort of difference there. Um, uh, and so, so we need to look at well, where is it? Where was it created? Where is it trying to be? Where is it being exploited? If the copyright doesn't subsist in the in the, the jurisdiction that it's um, you know that it, that's been created that it, that you're trying to enforce it, if if they don't recognise that AI works are uh, protected by copyright, then you're going to have real challenges enforcing any copyright there. Um, and who took part is going to be relevant as well. So. Uh, who, who did it? Who, how did they do it? There's going to be a lot of sort of factual requirements. That's what I was saying before about sort of series of prompts when you're kind of working through it um, to show that there has been some creativity uh, expressed there. And the other one is what has been agreed. Now, this by this, I, I mean uh, agreed with the generative AI platform. And to Frederick's point before, uh, if you're using the free version, it's a pretty unfavorable, as you might expect. You know, if you're not paying, you're the product, as the old saying goes, um, and you're being you, your prompts and your text are being used essentially to train that, and you can't guarantee that you will own it. Now, the terms and conditions they can change, um, but if the terms and conditions were that the platform owned any uh, copyright, then that is probably going to be determinative of who owns the copyright, certainly in England, so in, in, well, in the UK. So that copyright provision, section 9.3 that I mentioned before, the person who makes the arrangements necessary for the work to be created, and there's some case law on this I won't go into, that suggests very much that it would be the owner of the, the developer of the platform, essentially, that if anyone's going to own that copyright, it's probably going to be the developer. So, and, and then the terms and conditions that apply to the use of it, that might change the position, but it might not make it any better for you if you're using it. Um, so it, it, so the, in terms of uh, infringement, so there's there's two categories of infringement. Now this, this one won't, for this audience, I don't think training the AI is that relevant because unless you're also developing your own AI model and you're training it, in which case you'd probably be thinking about this quite a lot anyway. Um, you're not you're not too keen on what, or too worried about what was used to train it. It is still relevant though as to what the output is. So if I were to use a, I'll go to the next slide, which is the best example of this. 
If I were to use a generative AI tool, so this was uh, made using um, one of the main tools I won't mention. Um, and if I put in the prompt, uh, show me a picture of Marilyn Monroe, as we did with this one, um, Marilyn Monroe in the style of Andy Warhol. Surprise, surprise, it comes up as a um, as an image in the style of, uh, well, it basically looks like the Andy Warhol prints. I, I'm not sure if the colours are quite exactly the same as what they are, but they broadly looks like looks like the Andy Warhol print. Um, so if I've asked it to do that, separately to whether or not the, the underlying um, platform that I've used had the right to train on those on those types of works, and I probably doubt they did, um, then have I infringed when I've put this into uh, the the uh, the model that we used for this? If have I infringed? Now I think the chances are probably yes, because I've I've sort of asked it to, haven't I? I've asked it to create um, something which I know what it's what I want it to create. I'm asking it to do something in the style of Andy Warhol. It's been very difficult for me to get away with it. Uh, get away from a claim if one were brought uh, that 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 I have at least been responsible for the, the 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 copy the reproduction of the original work that has that has happened here. And there's an ongoing case which is which I'll mention now um, that where Getty Images are currently suing uh, Stability AI, which is the company behind Stable Diffusion, uh, for basically copying the entire data set. Uh, it was in something called the Leon 5B data set, which is, um, which I won't go into again. Um, and it's, and, and it, they, they accuse, so Getty Images is accusing Stable Diffusion of having copied the entire Getty database, or at least a large part of the Getty database, which was images alongside bits of metadata describing what it was to train their model. And Getty says the uh, sorry uh, yeah Getty says that the, the training was so good that if you look at the image on the right, which I, I hope you can probably tell is a um, is the AI generated one, it's even included the watermark. Um, so here we've got an example of now I don't know what prompt was used here. This is quite a sort of big piece, big piece of litigation. It wouldn't surprise me if quite specific prompts were used to sort of make it look as bad as it as it as it could. Um, but here you can see we've got a big load of data on the left and you've got one on the right. Now, if you're using that image on the right, have you infringed the, the, the image on the left? I think that it, there isn't a clear answer on that at the moment. And it would, I, my own view of it is it probably depend on which prompts were used and how obvious it was that, that, to you as the user. Um, but that does have knock on effects if you're using these sorts of tools. Uh, for client work, which I, I, I will come on to. Now, AI, and AI is not a new tool, as I, as I said before, it has its roots back in the 50s, although it can't, it, I don't think it would it sort of be recognizable to, um, to what we're using at the moment. But AI is around, if you have a, a spam filter in your in, for your email, inbox a firewall you have that you have ai you've been using it for years it, this this the generative ai that's been the the big um push on this and there's been various types of other forms of ai so there's not not generative ai that have caused real problems to those that have used them so amazon uh was recruiting uh so for sort of technical jobs it, it, it basically excluded women uh uber had real difficulty and i think amazon's had a similar issue with uh, I'd being able to identify uh, ethnic uh, people who are of a minority ethnic uh, background. So it's very good at telling the difference between white people, um, but it's not so good at telling the difference between black people. And uh, that was a major um, problem for Uber, as I think it, I, I think the, what I understand how it worked was that that you couldn't actually log into the app unless you'd proven that you were the person that was the license holder. But if it's not very good at telling one black person from another black person, and the, the license holder is a black person, and the person in front of the camera is a black person, then you can see where the problem arises. Um, so that, that's a, another um, issue. Uh, 
And then these generative AI chatbots. So um, Frederick mentioned, uh, sorry, Claire mentioned the, uh, you know, the the chatbot that they'd released on Twitter. Um, you know, you're never going to give a chatbot free reign to just do these things because they get they get dark very quickly, um, uh, and they do sort of always seem to go to extremes. Um, and and even sometimes if you try and have an argument with them, which I have um, done deliberately to see how how far they can get you, you, you it doesn't take very much to get them to be defensive apologetic you know it's it's weird the, the sort of the characteristics that they show but here on the left and I, I think this is Oliver I don't know if we've lost your sound or it could just be me Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. As I think I've put do not disturb on for some reason, teams are still trying to let someone ring. Uh, so this is on the left. Someone has been accused of, uh, uh, so Chachi, someone is accusing ChatGPT of having defamed him uh, because it, it got some of the facts mixed up. And this is a really important point. It makes things up. It gets things wrong and it's says them very confidently. So with this, this, this gentleman, I, I, my understanding of the story is that he um, was, he had been a whistleblower in a bribery story. But when ChatGPT was asked about his, who he is, it said that he was the bribe, he was involved in the bribery, not that he was a whistleblower. So it gets things wrong factually. I put my own name in, um, say, you know, who is Oliver Fairhurst? And it, at first, it wouldn't let me do it because it said I was a private individual. I managed to convince it I wasn't a private individual. Um, and it, it said, uh, it said, oh, sorry. Um, and it said Oliver is a partner at, a partner in intellectual property at, and then it had another law firm name. As far as I'm aware, I'm not a partner in that law firm. So, it, so it's, just, it's just made it up. And the hallucination issue is a really, really substantial one. Um, and then... Uh, a lawyer, and actually since this, since I put this slide together, another lawyer uh, has has got in trouble for uh, using ChatGPT. It created what sounded like a uh, a very plausible case citation, as we you know we always chuck in case citations into letters and submissions. It put it put some in. The case didn't exist. It looked plausible because um, it was in the right form, uh, and it looked like real names, but it just wasn't a real case. So. In terms of, and I'm sort of coming to the end of this bit, um, or my bit, what are the what are the main risks here? So confidentiality is a point. Frederick raised it. Are they using? Is the model using your data? Um, now, this if you've got some market sensitive information for a client. So say your client is a big oil company, and it's just had it's publicly listed, um, but it's got some kind of bad news coming, and you use the uh, a generative AI tool, a chatbot tool, to create the press release that you're gonna use as the basis to, to work from. If you've put that information in, do you know what's happening to that information? If I come along and say, oh, should I buy shares in said oil company? Is it gonna say, oh, I wouldn't buy them in this one because they're just about to announce, <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it, it, you don't know. So, uh, so, and that comes into the point I'll come on to in, in the next and last slide, which is about um, using free versions and not using them. You know, the integrity of your data that you're putting in, data protection is a really big one. Are you using personal data on it? Because that could be a real issue and, and I can't, I just don't have time to get into data issues. Accountability, how do you know what, what how, the, how the, it's a black box. You put something in, how do you rely on it? And if, if your client says to you, where did you come up with this? And you can't point to it and you think, oh, well, it just came out of um, chat GPT. The same for defamation. How are you going to prove things? If it's got factual points, especially if they're, they're you know, negative about any one, you know, that's just, it's, you know, you need to be using it no more as a sort of ideation, which was the point that um, Frederick says, so there still needs to be real human oversight into these things. Reputational damage. Part of the reputational damage, rep, reputational damage can even be your use of AI. Now, some businesses are really anti-AI. 
if you you know if you're dealing with a sort of creative um creative industries you know a lot of our clients are in the creative industries not all of them like ai they see it not only as a threat but they see it as something that has ripped off the creativity of of some of their members so there's a there's a real um reputational issue in using it now ultimately it's going to be used so and it's already being used and before long everyone will be using it so it's just a case of i'm just saying sort of just to modify that uh, the, the how you how you might uh, present that use sometimes it'll be positive but some clients wouldn't find it positive now when you not owning the output is probably the the biggest one from my perspective now if what you create needs to be owned and you're creating it using ai you can't guarantee that now if you've got a set of deliverables that you need to deliver to your client and you need to assign copyright in those and you're warranting that they that copyright does subsist or that all copyright is is being assigned got to bear that in mind in that con, in that contractual relationship now my own view is openness is probably the is probably the best policy on this um because if you if the client turns around and says all right i need to enforce this this product this sort of branding or this whatever has been ripped off can you you know we need we, i need to rely on that copyright how are you going to do that if you've and you can you can see it sort of um uh, unraveling and then the final point the risk is is sort of the other way inaction disadvantage so here you know frederick was talking about uh, they've been using ai for quite a long time i think um you know inaction is actually also a risk and using ai we kind of have to do it you know the point of i I've made before to others is, is you know, if you asked a lawyer, should we use the internet um, back in the 70s, the answer would probably be, hell no. <laughs> yeah. You know, why would you stick all this confidential information and put it put it elsewhere? And you just use it on a computer and, and you don't know where it goes, you don't know where it's stored, you don't know what happens if the thing blows up. Why would you use it? But you have to. So if these things are moving on and the disadvantage of not using them. Now, the sort of final point that I make is just some key takeaways. I think from my perspective, I would really you, I would really just encourage. So don't use free versions, just pay for it. They're not that expensive uh, and it improves your position immeasurably. Um, don't use generated text without supervision. There are some people in some businesses that have the sort of, let's, let's hand over AI to our, you know, some chatbot without any guardrails, without anything. Um, don't give it control of your Twitter feed, don't, you know, those kinds of things, because it's you're just spelling disaster um, or your client's Twitter feed might be a better um, analogy. Um, try not to get to prompt, prompt it deliberately to imitate people. So the, the Warhol point that I mentioned before. Um, and if you really need copyright to be to, to be able to protect the exploitation of what you're generating, generative AI might not be the best. Uh, route for that or you need to think about how you're improving your chances of copyright subsisting uh, only use trusted suppliers and i think that's where open ai has done very well um, because they have this association they're actually owned by not entirely owned by microsoft um there but they have this microsoft badge that is being applied to everything and if law firms see microsoft we you know we just go okay well that's fine isn't it so so i imagine most businesses are saying well open ai is a low risk one it's a trusted supplier and then you do need to train and educate employees most people don't really understand about ai they don't know what it is they don't know how it works they don't know what the risks are they just see it as a tool uh, and it, it is really important to train them educate them and then keep on doing that and i think setting acceptable use policies so as i say you can't be sort of king canute like and stand in the way of this it, you kind of have to accept that it's going to happen and you might want it to happen but you just want to guide it and a lot of what our clients are asking us to do at the moment is say we're a bit worried about what people are doing on the business in this can you create a sort of acceptable use policy that we can sort of send out make it part of their employment contracts and just say like, if you want to use AI, you have to use an approved one, you have to you know, use a paid for version and we've got other various other things that we suggest um, people use. Um, I think I'll stop sharing there.
That was really good. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in that. Lots of really great yeah. information. Thank you so much. Um, I'm conscious we have four minutes left. Um, so I'm going to just hand across the mic uh, to Kristen here just to talk about, based on all of that great information that we've we've just received, in terms of you know attribution, the client relationship. So I know you work with a lot of agencies to you know integrate technology, et cetera. How would you advise PR pros on the agency side to kind of integrate the technology and, and discuss that with the clients? Yeah, so it's, I, I mean, it is a, a bit of a how long is a string thing because it's how much are you integrating with AI and various different technology tools? Because the reality is we're, we're not getting away from these clever tools in anything we do. You know, there's already always a bit of um, assistance from the computer nowadays from the modeling we do to the placements of the press release. So I think it's always a good model to be clear and open with the fact that there is collaboration and we do use technology to assist in that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also can easily catch you out. So a lot of my clients will use it here and drip feed it here and there, or even their, their more junior staff will play with it on their laptop to tick a box and, and help with a project. And when you're not very open and honest with the fact that the tools are being used and we're working together with it, you will get caught out because, you know, as you've seen in all the examples, it is called artificial intelligence, but it isn't really intelligence. It's very, very clever machine learning. And it's the ability to take these huge data sets and do a lot with it and, and be very intelligent, but not to the level of awareness, um, which is obvious with the mistakes that are out there. So you know, with anything, we're, anytime I go into a client with a technology-driven solution, um, we're open about what we use, whether it be Tableau or ChatGPT or, you know, uh, Jarvis and an AI-generated content. Um, and then also really understand that it is a collaborative. You know, the ideations should always start with the strategy from you. And you should be working with these tools to support what it is that you want to produce as an end result. Um, and, you know, and I think that's where the fear here is, is that this is going to replace all these jobs. The reality is, no, it's just going to make some jobs very easier if we approach it in the right way. Um, and, yeah, and, and, you know, always I come back to, to my original journalist media ethics with it, which is if you feel that you're lying and trying to pull a fast one, it's probably a good idea to have an open and frank dialogue with your client about how you do things. Yeah, fantastic. And I, um, Oliver, I actually see you're typing uh, to this, but um, Joe Taylor has asked about legal issues in terms of being clear when AI is used uh, to the consumer. So not, not just the client side, but when I guess the brands that we're working with um, are using AI to deliver something to the, the consumer, whether that's a chair or a bag or or a piece of content um so oliver i just i don't know if you've got any kind of I mean, closing the, remarks at, on that at the moment we're at a stage where people are quite sort of actively promoting the fact that they've done stuff with, with ai because they're quite proud of it um and and they're sort of showing it's showing how innovative they are and, they're, and they're, how they're creating lots of different things we probably will get to a point where where most won't say it um again one of the issues with sort of promoting you using ai is that you're undermining your ability to protect what you're using so if again if you're using something here that, that might need protection so i think of it because i work with a lot of creative industries if they're sort of promoting that the particular sort of giving a decent chance that someone might someone might look at that and say well i i can use that because they can't stop me because there's no copyright in it you know that might be you're sort of inviting that i think in terms of openness there there's a data protection side of it, which is really important, and which I, I just we just don't have time to get into. But if you're if you're using AI in one of those really sensitive things, particularly recruitment, I think is a is a really dangerous sort of area to be using it. Um, uh, I, I think being transparent on it um, might cause you more risk. But at the same time, you're taking people's personal data and you're you're sort of analyzing them using AI. So you kind of have to be open with them. So there's a real sort of challenge on that. It, in, otherwise, it just sort of depends on the context. You know, I think if you're, and also your brand, if your brand is about sort of authentic, is an authentic sort of brand and and, and you you have a real sort of good connection with, with consumers and that's that's your style and that's your brand. If you're sort of 
using AI secretly in a way that, especially if it's sort of cutting your costs and doing all that sort of stuff, you're going to end up with a bit more criticism that way. And I think, you know, sort of being open uh, with, with consumers is probably best. And that's where most businesses, I think, are going. You know, chatbots that you use now have got so much better. I think there's one called Toby or something like that. They've got so much better now, but they actually quite open that it's AI and it's sort of got a little image of a robot on it. So, you know, but they've got better. So you don't mind using it. And then it switches over to a human. But if you then found out that that human was not a human, you would be really annoyed at the brand. So I think that it's very context specific. Um, Fantastic. I think that that's all we've really got time for. Um, we're two minutes over now. So um, thank you so much to uh, Frederick, to Kristen and to Oliver for all the great information. Um, thank you also to Richard and Gabriella from PRCA for helping arrange this. Um, I think there's, you know, there's some additional questions um, in the Q&A that we'll, we'll aim to kind of come back on. And this is the first of hopefully a few discussions like this. So, um, yeah, stay tuned for more.